My name is Mark Blythe and I am the director of the Rhodes Institute for International Economics and Finance here at Brown University and I'm one of the sponsors of this event. My partner in crime will introduce himself. My name is Timmons Roberts. I'm a professor at the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society and the Sociology Department. You'll be hearing more from him in a moment. Yes. By way of introduction, America's climate change future, housing market, stranded assets and entrenched interests. I'd like to welcome you all here. I'd like to welcome President Paxson, who we'll be hearing from very shortly, from Senator Whitehouse, from his staff and from everyone who's shown up today, all the panelists, presenters, to discuss this very important topic. A quick little uh, thing about the Rhodes Centre. The Rhodes Centre exists as an interdisciplinary research uh, institute within the Watson Institute. And interdisciplinarity is one of those words which academics love but seldom practice. Uh, we're, we're determined to overturn that. And the wonderful thing about climate change, if I can say that, because that's the worst phrase ever if you think about it, is that it demands a truly interdisciplinary approach. The scientists have to understand the politics, the political scientists have to understand the science, the sociologists have to understand everything. And this is, this is where we are and this is the task in front of us. So now I'm going to take up too much time simply just to say welcome to everyone for coming. I'm going to have um, Chris Paxson talk in a moment. I just want a couple of observations. And until a couple of weeks ago, I thought Polar Vortex was a brand of clothing worn by our undergraduates. Um, apparently it's not. And uh, I have a brother who lives in New Zealand and um, they're heating up, nothing in comparison to what's going on in Australia, which is truly frightening. Um, the way that economists and political scientists, I'm kind of half and half, tend to think about climate change or tended to think about climate change was, we call it an externality. It's something that's produced that's not fully accounted in the behavior itself. I think that's woefully insufficient now. It's no longer something external to us. This is the thing we need to focus on. I'll start now. Thank you. Chris Paxson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And I, and I want to thank everybody for, for coming. This is such a wonderful turnout, and it shows a lot about the urgency and important of the importance of the issues that we'll be discussing today. And thanks to the organizers. Thank you, Senator, for coming and getting this going. And uh, I, I hope you all have a great day uh, talking about these issues. So, you know, we this is probably a group that's very well informed. We all read the same climate reports. We all read the news. And every report seems to be bleaker than the last, more alarming than the last. So, you know, last fall the IPCC report said that with two degrees of warming, we'll have massive declines in fishing and the death of nearly all coral reefs in the world. Uh, the fourth national climate assessment is just unsparing in uh, the the you know, the strength of statements about the, the uh, cost of climate change to human health and the economy and planetary support systems. So, you know, we, we, we've all read this. We all know this. And these reports and others like them are very important. They raise public awareness of the challenges we face. And despite what some people think, the science behind the reports is really, really compelling. So we have to stand up and take notice of it. Now, the science is very complex and some of the policy issues and institutional issues that you're going to be discussing today are equally complex. But it, it seems to me, and this could be debated after I, I have to leave right after this, you can disagree with me all you want. Uh, there, there are some things that we need to do that seem really, really crystal clear, right? And that we should be focusing on now, in addition to some of the other things that you're going to be talking about today. And the first, which is a no-brainer, is to put a price on carbon that reflects its social cost. That's something we need to do. And I'll take a little bit of issue about externalities being woefully inadequate. Uh, I actually think it's a wonderful piece of economic theory. Before I came to Brown, I taught future policymakers about the, um, you know, basics of microeconomic policy analysis, and there was always a week on externalities. And 
you know, these, as Mark so well said, are, are things that happen when agents in the economy and producers and consumers don't factor in the social costs of their actions, whether they're producing something or consuming something. And the most obvious textbook example of an externality has to do with pollution, where, you know, consumption market prices don't reflect the damage that's being done. This isn't new science. This is very, very old science. So the concept of externalities was first formalized in 1920 by an economist named Arthur Pigou uh, in his book, The Economics of Welfare. And he proposed, in addition to formalizing the theory, he proposed how to correct for an externality, which is to impose what has been called by economists since then, not surprisingly, a Pigovian tax, named after him. And the solution is just brilliant in its simplicity. It's, it's dead easy, which is that you m impose a tax or do some other policy action that makes the price reflect the damage. That's it. So, you know, this isn't new. This is very old. We've known it for a long time. And, you know, I will say economists are a really contentious lot. We find many, many, many things to argue about, and it, I think it undermines our profession because people sort of say, how do we believe anything you say? You never agree. But this is one area where there is no disagreement. Only last week, coming out of the annual Economics Association meetings, a group of very prominent economists, including our three former Federal Reserve chairs, um, Ben Bernanke, and uh, Janet Yellen and um, Alan Greenspan, I remember his name, they produced a statement that simply says, we need a carbon tax. Says it a little bit longer form than that. And they, and they opened it up for economists around the world to sign on. I signed on. And I think it makes a really good statement. So, you know, no brainer. We, we need to push on that. The, the second point that I do want to make, though, is that we can't sit around waiting for a carbon tax to happen. Right? Because if we do that, by the time we get the policies in place to fix what's going on, it's going to be too late to do the remediation and make the changes that we need to not, well, to avert really disastrous consequences for the planet. So institutions, whether they're companies or cities or universities, have to start moving to a carbon neutral world now. They have to do it now. And, you know, I, I'm going to brag a little bit about Brown because I think, like many colleges and universities, we're taking the issue seriously. Last month, we made good or we signed an agreements that will let us make good on a commitment that we made 10 years ago to cut on-campus greenhouse gas, gas emissions by 42 percent below 2008 values, 2007 uh, levels, by 2020. So we're coming up on 2020. And we did so in a way that promises to be sustainable and also advance Rhode Island's clean energy agenda. So specifically, what did we do? Uh, we signed two renewable energy uh, purchase power agreements, uh, one with a Rhode Island-based solar power provider and the other with a Texas-based wind provider, power provider. And basically, what this will do is essentially decarbonize Brown's, all of Brown's purchased energy sources, not on-campus combustion, but what we buy in the form of electricity. And it's going to take us by 2020 not to meet our goal for 2020, but significantly past our goal for 2020, which is terrific. Uh, and we're developing our post-2020 plans now with the support of Brown faculty, Brown students, there's been a lot of really terrific engagement to do even better. And of course, you know, when you think about it, what's the next step? And that is to tackle on-campus combustion or, you know, the, the natural gas that we burn in order to heat all of the buildings and supply the campus. So I'm hoping to announce those plans very, very soon. Uh, and I'm excited about the work that we've done. And, you know, I'm saying this by way of example. This is the kind of work that cities, universities, companies all around the world are starting to undertake and undertake seriously. It's important. So the last point that I'm going to make is about the need for strong scientifically based advocacy. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to give a Brown example. You have to bear with me, but I, I, I like what's going on in this campus. So in one example, in 2013-14, uh, Timmins Roberts and a group of students 
took a deep dive into moving forward a legislative effort of positioning Rhode Island to adaptively plan and manage climate change. And our students and Timmons, I want to give him credit, but I think it was really student driven, right? Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, they partners with policymakers, they partnered with environmental and planning organizations, they gathered input from coastal stakeholders and local governments. They came to me and said, I think it was probably November, we want to get a law passed by the end of the coming legislative session. And I said, you're crazy, right? You just can't do that. Rhode Island moves too slowly. And lo and behold, by the end of that legislative session, Rhode Island, and again, in collaboration, it wasn't just the students, it was a large number of other stakeholders, uh, passed the Resilient Rhode Island Act, which was signed into law then. And so I got a good taste of what Brown students are capable of. Now, I've had discussions since then that this act was a good first step. It's not a good final step. And we need to do more to put teeth into that legislation to make sure that we're really protecting this state from the effects of climate change. But I think it points to the strength of effective advocacy, coalition building, science-based, thoughtful work that communities, students, but people all around the country can do. And that's important. So let me just close with this. Uh, I read Monday's Projo, uh, the cover story cited research that was undertaken by URI and the Coastal Resource Management Council. And it really showed in vivid detail how vulnerable this state is. And they honed in on Barrington and Bristol and Warren and, and what, what can happen to them in the future in terms of flooding with sea level rise. And the consequences are quite alarming. And, you know, like, like the other things that I've noted, these plans are grounded in science, they're grounded in knowledge and facts, the physics of rising o ocean temperatures and, and changes in currents and, and, and everything that we need to know. And it aims, this type of work, aims at really elevating public attention and awareness to the issue of climate change. So, you know, this is just to underscore that, you know, advocating for strong policies, taking strong actions in our own institutions, advocacy, but also this public outreach and awareness, I think is really important if we're going to make progress. So uh, that's it. I'm, I'm looking forward. I have to leave, and, but I'm going to come back at lunch. And I want to learn a lot about the discussions today. Uh, very exciting. And thanks again for all of you for coming and for your work supporting this agenda. Thanks. Thank you, President Paxson. I have to say I'm honored to uh, work in a place uh, where we have climate leaders. Uh, that is, what she has done for Brown University um, has been extraordinary. This, I mean, entirely decarbonizing our electricity in the next two years, I think that's uh, spectacular. Um, it is. And it's going to end up, apparently, um, saving the university's money on its uh, electricity purchases. Look, I can make this go up. Um, and then also, um, she's supported uh, this work that we did on legislation, including um, the Resilient Rhode Island Act, which set emissions reduction targets of 80% by 2050, um, and also, which were not binding, unfortunately, and now we're working to make them binding in these, this year and, and in future years and to make them more ambitious because those were largely based on um, science from the 1990s. So the more recent science suggests that we need to get to zero much faster. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but she also, so she supported these teams of researchers and we've hired consultants and done a lot of work. And we've also worked for the last four and a half years on carbon pricing. So it's called the Energize Rhode Island Act. We have a whole coalition in the state. Some of our members are here. I'm excited to see you all here. So we're looking forward to that session. Um, so uh, my whole introduction of uh, Pre President Paxson um, got turned around because she does need to go. Um, but I had a lot, a lot of um, congratulations to say. This is a report that I, is worth seeing. There's also a lot on the website um, of the annual sustainability report for Brown University. You'll see just how much is going on, and especially this plan to decarbonize the university, including our, our heating, our buildings, our fleet of vehicles, and so on. Um, over the next five years or so. 
So I'm going to um, try to set up the conference a bit to here, if I can make this thing work, not being a PC person. Let's see, I think I do this. OK. And I've got a little PowerPoint. And then I'm going to introduce um, our amazing Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Um, so let's see here. So um, Mark has already welcomed everybody. I'd like to acknowledge that we are um, on Wampanoag and Narragansett uh, ancestral lands. This is sort of an emerging norm to recognize that at the beginning of conferences. Um, um, my job, again, is to sort of talk about the task that we face as we address climate change, um, why it's so important that we act ambitiously. Um, what I see is the core question for social scientists of climate change, given the sort of conjuncture that we're in in the United States of uh, stalled or actually rollback of our, the tiny bits of climate action that we actually had in our public policy. Um, and then talk about the days ahead, the sort of papers that you're going to be hearing um, and the lunch and so on. So. Um, I'm, I work at the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. I would like to acknowledge my faculty and student colleagues, and especially our director, Amanda Lynch. I'm thrilled you're able to come today. Um, so Amanda has led us um, since about 2012, is that right? And it's really become a, a force on the campus, and it's also been one of the strategic focuses of Brown University to um, work on its goal of sustaining life on Earth. And uh, IBIS does this um, through five focal areas, working on climate science, conservation science, land change science, environmental health, and then institutions and human behavior. Um, so we're sort of very interdisciplinary. We work uh, across the university and with partners around the world. Uh, I run something called the Climate and Development Lab. Uh, I see it as a different sort of thing. We have about a dozen or so undergraduates, a few doctoral students, some of whom are over here. Um, some of the undergraduates are here. Some of our alumni are here who are now leaders in the state of Rhode Island uh, and they're around the world. So what we do is we co-identify topics and I think this is different than the traditional scientific model of identifying a topic in your office or lab and then trying to publish it as a scholarly journal sort of going straight from, you know, your um, ivory tower to a scholarly journal and then turning it into some sort of a press release or something. So we have a different kind of model that I've been experimenting with for the last 10 years uh, since I've been at Brown. So identifying these topics with partners. And so we've done that a long time. We worked at the United Nations Framework Convention. We would, I would take students around the world every November and sometimes in May to these negotiations, we would work with groups like ICAD, the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. Now we're working in the United States. We decided, I decided in November last year to focus on this question of climate denial and this resistance to action in the United States. So we're working with partners like Climate Files, Climate Investigation Center, those were two that I thought of last night when I was putting those in and our partner, Kurt Davies, at the Climate Investigation Center is here. We're going to hear from him later today really a leader in the world on, on identifying and tracking sort of networks of influence um, that are blocking climate action in the United States. We do team-based research. We release um, policy briefings. We do blogging, tweeting, press conferences. We've done uh, side events at the UN negotiations, um, so often with these partners. Uh, and then we've done briefings. For example, in Washington, we briefed uh, uh, Senator Whitehouse's um, Climate Action Task Force in the U.S. Senate, um, and some of the people who are going to be on the third panel today were there, Justin Farrell and Carrie Ard um, and Robert Brule. So, and then we turn those into um, books and journals and so on. And then we, you know, sort of release that again. And what I was going to say is that we hear from those policymakers uh, when we get it wrong or when they don't like what we say. And I think that's been very informative to get that input before we go public, it was, sorry, before we go into the scholarly literature. And then, of course, if there are real problems, we're going to hear about it later. But there have been some things where we, you know, the Dutch uh, delegation was mad at us because it made them look bad, our ranking of how they were doing on uh, climate adaptation funding, for example. Uh, or, you know, local policymakers not happy with how we're 
characterizing their work. So we maybe adjust how we say things, or maybe we don't when we find out we say here's why, you know, here's the evidence on which we've uh, made that claim. So, so there's clear, here we go, here why, why we need to deal with this issue. There's clear evidence of, of climate change. Here the planet is already warmed. This is global mean temperatures by uh, one degree centigrade, almost two degrees Fahrenheit. And this is not even around the planet at all. It's based, of course, as you know, on carbon dioxide uh, rising. And let me see if there's a pointer here. Here you can see we're up here and skyrocketing above, we're actually we're above 400 parts per million, about 410. Um, which is, in, there are indeed fluctuations, and a lot of the talking points of climate deniers or those downplaying this um, often talk about these fluctuations. There's always been fluctuations in temperatures and carbon dioxide. I hope my climate scientist colleagues are okay with how I'm uh, characterizing this, but we are now in a very unusual uh, time that can only be explained by human action. The Paris Agreement um, sought to keep this warming as close to, as possible to one and a half degrees Celsius. I'll show what that means in a minute. Um, one degree of warming is, one and a half degrees is bad and two degrees is really bad. I mean, this is what this latest special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change showed. And I'll just, I won't read these all, but the impacts are much worse when you get to two degrees. And we're headed way above two degrees. If we stay on um, uh, business as usual, we're headed to, um, uh, you know, four degrees, three or four degrees. I'll show that in a minute. Now, what does this mean locally? Um, this, uh, oddly, this graph turned on its side between my version and the Mac, I guess, and the PC. Um, so we did, a, with Greg Willenius and Melissa Elliott at the School of Public Health here, just, just looked at the um, number of days above 80 heat index for, at the TF Green Airport um, and going back to the 1950s. And the numbers uh, have gone from about 52 days per summer over 80 degrees heat index. And now we're over 82 days over 80 and the heat index in the last four years. We're trying to do five-year averages to see what's happening. So what that means is uh, four more weeks of heat. And there's more days that are much hotter than that. And 80 degrees matters because that's when there's this very strong uptick in number of admissions to the emergency room for things like asthma, and uh, you know, cardiovascular and pulmonary um, you know, distress. And so it's causing huge problems. So you've seen maybe different characterizations of where it's li what it's like. This is the summertime. It looks like our, our summers are gonna be more like Deerfield Beach in Florida. The other point here is that it's not evenly felt. That is, um, some people are feeling the heat much worse. It's especially in urban areas without trees and without ground cover that are covered with asphalt and concrete and roofing tiles, and those warm up and stay warm all night, and then they never cool down. So they get hotter and hotter as we get in heat waves, and it's very dangerous. So what about the polar vortex? You all are wondering on a cold morning, um, getting in here, it's 10 degrees here in Providence for those who are on the web stream. Everybody else knows this. So here's a tweet from our, uh, our noble leader, uh, President Trump, in the beautiful Midwest, wind chill temperatures are reaching minus 60 degrees, the coldest ever recorded in the coming days, expected to get even colder. People can't last outside for even minutes. What the hell's going on with global warming? Please come back fast. We need you. Um, this is just reckless uh, characterization of the problem we face. We don't need more global warming, and we don't need it fast. I mean, there's some many ways to respond to this, but Climate change doesn't mean that there's no more cold weather anywhere ever. In fact, the warming of the Arctic is making this jet stream, which, which used to be quite much more stable, keeping the cold air in the Arctic has now gotten weaker. There's a difference of temperatures between the, the North Pole, the, the, you know, the Arctic, and the equator is now much decreased, and so this jet stream has gotten weaker. Uh, it doesn't stay in this nice circle, and so we have these big lobes of cold air that drop down. Um, so basically, the North Pole's weather has gotten pushed over us. So that, yes, it's freezing cold, but that means it's not cold somewhere else, and global mean temperatures are changing. Did I do all right there? This is an Arctic <laughs> climate scientist. This is Amanda Lynch, so I'm, I'm feeling a lot of pressure on this one. 
So what's causing it, of course, are fossil fuel emissions. Here's where they are. You can see just how much we've increased our emissions of carbon dioxide in the world and how recently. Sorry, these dates are a little chopped off. But um, mostly since about 1950. And the U.S. and China are the big players. Um, and so a lot of the future will be determined in China and Asia and uh, everywhere else. So it's a global problem. How badly are we doing? Well, here's the baseline case heading in our, this is gigatons of emissions per year, over 60 tons, gigatons per year. We're now at about 48. Uh, here we're uh, over 50. Um, here's the Paris Agreement. Pledges, unconditional pledges are out here. Uh, these are conditional pledges. That means if we give money to developing countries, then they can do a little bit more. That'll keep us about here. These are we're headed, if we want to stay within two degrees, we need to be way down here. If we want to stay within one and a half degrees, uh, we need to be way down here. And we need to be headed for zero net emissions just after 2050. Here's an interesting little um, animation done by uh, Glenn Peters at Cicero in Norway. And what he shows is that if we're not counting on these things called negative emissions. So all these are negative emissions. And most of the scenarios that were put forward by the IPCC and other groups count on us being able to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, either through massive agricultural planting, especially across the tropics, and then burning that biomass and putting, sticking it underground, somehow storing that carbon dioxide, or other means of mechanically or chemically taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. All those are expensive or unproven. And so it's, you know, some people say that this is unicorns, that basically these are fantasy uh, ideas about what is going to be feasible economically and practically in the future. And so what's much more realistic is for us to not count on them, that it would be much more prudent for us to count on no or very little negative emissions in our future scenarios. So look at how much faster we have to reduce our emissions. We basically need to be almost at zero by 2030. So I think these ambitious actions are the right actions for us to be taking for ourselves, for our children. And again, what I was trying to show before is that it's not just our children and grandchildren anymore. It's now us. Uh, now, who's actually taking adequate action? Unfortunately, the picture isn't very good. Morocco and the Gambia are, is the answer uh, to really keeping us within a one and a half degree world. If we're looking at a two degree world, we have five more countries whose pledges under the uh, Paris Agreement are adequate uh, to keeping us under two degrees. A lot of other countries are insufficient. Some are highly insufficient. And then there's the critically insufficient ones that are basically sending us towards a four, over four degrees Celsius of warming. And that includes, unfortunately, the United States. China, importantly, is here also in highly insufficient. So, uh, and here's a nice graph that Robert Brule, Bob Brule, um, uh, had updated uh, the other day by his group um, looking at uh, whether people really care about climate change. And unfortunately, they aren't acting as if they do very much. They're not looking it up on Google anyway. And surveys often show that people say they care about climate change, but when ranked with other issues like unemployment, health care, crime, immigration, so on, or that then um, climate change comes out at or near the bottom. It's often ranked 10th or 15th. So this is some of the politics of climate change. People often don't vote on this. So to put this together into some kind of picture of what uh, lies in front of us today, this is what I consider, at least I've taken this on as my uh, guiding question for my research group now as we switch to understanding the United States. Why isn't there a science-based policy on climate change in the United States? So there's different parts of this answer. And a lot of the guiding social science has been informed by what's been called the information deficit model. Uh, it's kind of a, maybe that's too simple of a characterization of it. But the idea is that if people were just better informed, they would act. And so for 30 years now, uh, we've been doing our best to educate our students and the public uh, as scientists, as academics, as teachers, as maybe activists, uh, and others that people just, if you just knew the, about the science better, then we would see action in the United States. And what, I think that's what the really exciting thing about today is we're going to explore some of the ways and the reasons why we aren't seeing the action that we should have. Um, so 
some of these sessions this morning are going to give us the perspective of economists. That is, that there's a lack of incorporation, as President Paxson said, of the, the damages that are being caused by climate change into the pricing of the stuff that we do, that it's not being incorporated. There's still externalities that are not included. That we're going to hear in this first session about property values, including on the coast of Rhode Island, um, that are just beginning to uh, see the impact of people's awareness rising and their understanding of the risk that their properties face uh, as sea levels rise, as we have these now new maps and projections of what a 100-year storm would be like with 5 feet or even 10 feet of sea level rise, uh, which are not as far off as we thought they were going to be. Um, so that's session one. Uh, and we'll have uh, Kurt Spaulding will be uh, our chair for that. He's the um, former director of Save the Bay, which was the big, um, you know, uh, stalwart protector of the Narragansett Bay here in Rhode Island. And then he was EPA's Region 1 director um, during the Obama administration. And uh, now he is in our IBIS at the Institute of Brown for Environment and Society as a professor of the practice. Um, the second session, uh, which is about corporate assets and whether, you know, they, the values of companies and uh, really include these externalities of the cost of climate change. And, and then what's going to happen if we do act as ambitiously as we just saw we need to act, then quite a lot of the assets of companies are going to be worthless or are going to be very quickly turning worthless. Um, some of them will be either in coastal areas or they'll be based on the burning of fossil fuels and need to be converted into something new. So will carbon prices, how can carbon prices be incorporated in the values of corporations, of institutions, and of, you know, how can this be a government policy of carbon pricing or taxing carbon? Um, so a lot of that session will be about carbon taxes. The SAP, oh, and then we will have a, uh, a lunch keynote speech by um, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. That will be over in the new center right across this little Watson quad. It's called the... Stephen Roberts something. It's a little bit confusing name because it's the same as our other student center, but it's right across the quad. That'll be at 1230, so we'll have to walk out and uh, go across there where um, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse will give us a keynote address at lunch and we'll have some more discussion there. And then we're going to be back over here. For the people who are watching on the web webcast, there are three different links for these three parts of the web stream, so you'll need to go back to this website um, and you can look for it at the Watson um, uh, at brown.edu website. So in the afternoon, we're going to have sessions about uh, effective mis misinformation and block blocking coalitions in Congress and in state capitals. Um, so we're going to have sociologist perspectives um, on what's going on. Uh, the final session, of course, is a discussion of what can we do about it um, and, you know, what are some useful approaches. Uh, and we're going to hear from some of the people who are working in that area. We'll have Kurt Davies come up from the Climate Information Center, and we'll have a uh, discussion back in here as, you know, with including you all. Um, if people are interested uh, in the TV land in trying to send in questions, we will do our best. Um, one way to send them in would be by um, text, I'm um, sorry, tweeting them to amclimate19. So hashtag AmClimate19 is what we're going to try to use to keep track of that. Here's just two bits of information from my um, Climate and Development Lab. I have to pump my students' work very quickly, showing who has testified against uh, climate change legislation in the state of Rhode Island. This is on 49 pieces of legislation. Uh, this is in a case, um, uh, this is a count for Congress. And then a project led also by the lab showing these coalitions um, that we just released in Washington of denialist organizations that have effectively stopped the United States from acting on climate change. So I've gone on too long. I want to hand the microphone over to Senator uh, Whitehouse. Senator Whitehouse, of course, is a leader in the U.S. Senate. He um, speaks every week about climate change in every usually Wednesday afternoon if you're ever in Washington. Stop by the Rhode Island office and get a pass and go to the visitor's gallery. He's spoken, I think, 270 times telling our country to wake up. It's time to wake up on climate change. He is a genuine leader on this issue. And um, 
He was the U.S. Uh, attorney under appointed by Clinton. He was the Rhode Island Attorney General and the Assistant AG before that. He's on a bunch of really important committees. Of course, you've probably seen him on Judiciary, Budget, Finance, and Environment and Public Works, where he's on three different subcommittees. Um, he's, again, a real climate warrior, and I'm really grateful for all his support for the work we're doing and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you so much for being here today. Glad to be here. You, come you can come on up while I mess around with this. Well, I'm going to be super brief because we're already past the time when the first That's right. panel should start. So I'm just going to say thank you. I'll speak uh, at greater length uh, at lunch. Um, I do think that there is a nexus of climate and denial and risk that needs to be properly understood for us to address this question. And it is very, very rarely properly understood. In part, that is because there is an apparatus of unprecedented scale designed to cause misunderstanding, in part is because of just a certain amount of indolence and entropy and human behavior. But I consider this conference to be extremely important because it brings together those three elements in a way that the narrative on climate change usually fails at doing. This is a big deal. Uh, if you have a chance to do a little bit of light reading in your spare time, I recommend a wonderful book called Bury the Chains, which is about a small group of people who banded together and successfully ended the industry of slavery in England. They started very small in the basement of a nondescript bookstore in an non-fancy neighborhood in London, and they brought down the biggest industry in the country by a variety of methods. And I think when the history is written of how we buried the fossil fuel chains, um, this meeting and the assembly of climate denial and risk into a coherent narrative will be a part of that story. So never underestimate what a small number of people can do. Uh, we need to command this narrative, and as I'll speak further at lunch, I think we're at a tipping point where we can do so. Thank you. Thank you.